January, we're dealing with our theme, Be Still and Know That I Am God, and uh, we're now transitioning back to the series in the book of Hebrews, and so we're looking at uh, chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, and uh, if I can uh, do well on my timing here, we'll actually finish the chapter because it's just several statements that I want to make of clarity for this uh, message here today. But uh, as, we, as we look here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 26, as, as it was read earlier by Pastor Mike, you understand that uh, it wasn't one of those heartwarming passages uh, as we were reading earlier in our uh, portion of Psalms. This is more of a passage that's drawing our attention to something that's very serious. The term fear is mentioned in this text twice, and uh, we'll be talking about that. It is one of those difficult passages of Scripture that if you just read it with uh, without really thinking what is it uh, talking about here and not, not understanding the whole context of the book of Hebrews, uh, you could be misled uh, in its interpretation, as many have been uh, down through the years of reading into this passage something that's not stated here. So I'm going to do my best to make uh, this as clear as mud for you here this morning, okay? Uh, you don't understand that terminology yet. No, I'm going to make it a little clearer than mud, but I'm going to try to clear up some discrepancies and give you the understanding that is uh, put forth here in the Scriptures. I think if you understand uh, what is being presented here, you will not go away with the idea that you can lose your salvation. That is not what this portion of Scripture is talking about, although I've had people explain it or believe that erroneously. Uh, it's not talking about those <clears throat> who are truly saved and backslidden either. Uh, it is... Uh, a reference here to uh, something other than that. And so if you bear with me here, I will, I will get into that. But I want to start by giving you the title <clears throat> because this is exactly what I believe uh, I want to relate to you from this portion of Scripture. The title I've given this message is Settling Your Fears. Settling Your Fears. And how do you settle, settle your fears about your relationship with God? And uh, the text here if you just read it and not have an understanding of it, it doesn't settle your fears at all. It actually makes you fearful. Uh, but let's, let's uh, begin here with uh, uh, just um, an opening a few words and an illustration I'd like to share with you, and then we'll get into the description that's in our text. Let me ask you a question. What frightens you? What are your fears? What causes you to have the shake, shakes or consume your mind when you're confronted with something of uh, uncertainty. There have been times in my life where I've actually been so fearful that it's, it just stopped me in my tracks. There's been times where I've actually had uh, the uh, sense of uh, just an uneasiness, uh, chills. You ever had the, the, the experience of chills going up the back of your neck and just like, okay, something's not right, what is this? Or just after a near-death experience where all of a sudden your body just starts kind of trembling a little bit. That's, that's the idea it's really being put forth here in the scriptures, this idea of being fearful. But I don't want you to misunderstand that it is not something that you, as a true follower of Jesus Christ, should ever have to fear. But I have found true followers of Jesus Christ actually fear it for lack of understanding of what is being stated here. So I want to settle your fears here this morning, but let me give you an illustration. My dad, who served in Vietnam as a Navy CB, uh, I don't remember in context when he was actually over in Cuba, but he, I remember him telling me a story of him being at Cuba, and uh, they had a little downtime, and so they went out snorkeling in the beautiful waters there off the coast, and as they were snorkeling, um, he got kind of distracted, and the guys separated out, and uh, so he came up uh, from, from diving, and he looked over, and he saw his, his buddies were all on the, on the rocks, and uh, they were waving to him to come in, and they just kept waving at him, kept waving at him, so he was kind of frustrated, but he was like, okay, fine, I'll just swim back in, so he starts swimming back in, and the closer he got, and he would look up once in a while, they kept waving, and what he didn't realize, they were yelling at him, get in here, get in here, and he saw the intensity on their faces, so he started swimming faster. And by the time he got up on the rocks and turned around, and if I remember correctly, it was either a school of barracuda or a school of sharks that were following him, and he had no idea what was going on, but these guys were smart enough to get out of the water and try to motion him to get in. And I give you that illustration because here was, in this case, my father who was absolutely oblivious to what was around him. He had no fear because he had no knowledge of what was going on. Where his buddies that were frantically waving him in, trying to get him out of the water so he would not be consumed by these fish, uh, understood that he needs to fear and he needs to hightail it and get in here as fast as he can. 
And so obviously my dad made it back and he was able to tell me that story some years later. But I want you to understand something about that illustration. My father didn't see the danger, his friends did. But this is also true of those who don't believe on Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. They are spiritually blinded to the truth and they have no fear of the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ. But God says that they should fear. And you say, well, I thought God was a God of love. Oh, he is. But he's also a God of justice. And we have to understand something about our God, that God sent his own son who also was God. There's no difference between the deity of Jesus Christ and the deity of the Father or the deity of the Holy Spirit. They are one. We understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth in order to walk this earth and ultimately lay his life down for my sins, for your sins. And our text says here in verse number 26, and if you'll look at it with me, for if we sin, what's the next word? Willfully. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Notice what it says in verse 27, the first reference of this idea of fear. But a certain, fearful, looking for of what? Judgment and of fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Notice also, if you would, in verse number 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Notice also, if you would, Hebrews chapter 12 in verse number 21. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 21. Here we have Moses. Notice what it says about Moses. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. We understand that the these words fear all have the same meaning, and Moses adds to the fact that he feared and he trembled in fear. And those who reject Jesus Christ, the writer of Hebrews is saying, this is true of them, but they're blinded to it. They don't see it. They don't understand that they should fear, but they don't because they have no comprehension of the truth They've never personally received Jesus Christ and they're blinded. The Bible tells us that Satan blinds the minds of those today who do not believe. Now, if you said that to do an unbeliever, they would just scoff at you. They'd laugh at you. They would just say, that makes no sense. You know, that's, that's all your fairy tale. There's just no concept of fearing. Like my father not fearing what was in the water with him because he had no concept. He didn't see it. Others need to fear for those because they have no idea of fear. Why should they fear God? Why should they fear eternity without God? Why should they fear a place called hell? They don't because they have no knowledge. Now, the interesting thing about our text is it's going to talk about those who have understood and heard the truth. They have had knowledge of the truth. And it is they who have rejected that knowledge and now stand in judgment of God. And so, let me come back now to our portion of scripture and help you to understand a few things. I want you to notice in verse number 26, that simple word, I did a little study with you before on this, the word for, right at the beginning of verse 26, for if we sin. I want you to understand that word for there is a word that's directing our attention back to a previous statement of a truth. And so when we see that word for there, we have to go back and just like the wherefore or the therefores in the scripture, we go back and see what it's in reference to. And I want you to understand that this word for here as a conjunction, it it is affirming what has been stated earlier, and it refers back to a truth as a verification of that truth. And so we see here in verse number 26 says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the truth. We understand the knowledge of the truth. We realize it's in many cases, a direct reference to what was just stated before. Sometimes it's going back to the totality of the context of Scripture. And I don't want to bog it down in, in interpretation, but this is what you need to understand when you study the portion of Scripture. If we were to just read this verse out of context right now, you could make it say what you want it to say. But we can't do that. We have to stay in the context. There's also another verse in here that we'll get to that gives us a reference point to go back to. What are we looking at? Where was this statement made? What is it in, in reference to? 
And so I want you to understand that I believe, based on my studies here and, and many others that have studied this portion of Scripture, it's making reference in the immediate back to the drawing near to God. As we see here in verse 22, 23, 24, 25 says, Don't forsake the assembling yourselves together. The writer of Hebrews was writing to encourage and exhort Christians, those who are going through persecution, stay faithful to God. Don't walk away from the commitment you've made to Christ. Why would he do that? Because they were going through times of persecution where it was easier for Christians to just walk away. It was easier for them to go back to Judaism. It was easier for them to go back to the things where they would now be accepted again by their peers and their loved ones. They could run their businesses. They could still survive, okay? But because they were taking a stand for Christ, they were being persecuted for Christ. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to encourage them, don't go back on what you believe in your heart. And so we could, all, we could also go back and look at this in the sense of what has Hebrews been teaching us? It's been teaching us the superiority of Jesus Christ to the law, to Moses, to the priests, to the sacrificial system. All this has been taught in our previous chapters here. And so as we put this in context, we understand that it's, 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 it's encouraging those who have made a decision for Christ not to go back on that decision. And it's also encouraging them to stay faithful to the superiority that they find that Jesus Christ is God, that he paid everything necessary. What is there for you to go back to if you know Christ personally? And so as we move through this, the most common thought on this verse is that it's speaking of some general sin or repetitive sin that has caused a, a true believer to just kind of flounder in their faith. But let me read you something from a commentator named Adam Clark. I think he did a very concise way of explaining this. It has nothing to do with backsliders in our common use of the term. A man may be overtaken in a fault, or he may deliberately go into sin, yet neither renounce the gospel nor deny the Lord that bought him. His case is dreary and dangerous, but it is not hopeless. What he's describing there is, that, listen, I know this from my own personal life. There's times where I've wandered from God. I'm not proud of it, but I'm glad that God was gracious and merciful to me. Even when I was living in my own desires and doing what I wanted to do as someone who had made a profession of faith, uh, desired to honor God, there were times where I chose to willfully go against God, but yet I didn't lose my salvation I desired to get right with God, but I still desired to do sinful things. And I would say that's probably the case for many, many Christians or most Christians. It's just something that we still have this sin nature attached to us, and it's hard sometimes to shake that. It must be a purposeful walk with God to shed the sins of our youth and to walk away from things that tempt us into going against God. And so we're not talking here about those who would lose their salvation we're not talking about those who are backslidden for a time, but still have a desire to get right with God. I want you to notice that would actually oppose other portions of Scripture. If you would take the time to study First and Second Corinthians, we see an interaction with the Apostle Paul. He writes a letter to the Corinthian church, chapter number 5, where a man has had an incestuous relationship with his mother. And the Apostle Paul writes to condemn this and says that this man won't repent of this, kick him out of the church and let Satan take care of him? What a strong statement. And how easily today as Christians we just put up with people's immorality and sinfulness. That was a strong statement. Well, if you fast forward to 2 Corinthians, it seems to be indicating that he says of that same person, don't keep resisting him. If he's repented and wants to come back in, you welcome him back in and you make things right. Restore that one to fellowship. See, a lot of Christians miss that part of the Bible. We're all good at kicking people out. But God says, hey, if they truly repent and they want back in, then you need to love them back in and help them to grow in their faith. Most people don't have that kind of humility today, though. They'll just go somewhere else, and they'll just kind of drift off the scene, and sometimes Christians won't let them come back because they don't understand their own Bible. They understand judgment. They don't understand grace and love and mercy. And there's not one of us who could stand, folks, not one of us. We must be understanding of the full, the, the, the full knowledge of what it means to be a, a true Christian. That's just one illustration about someone who has been in the church, violated certain things, but then the Apostle Paul says, if he repents, receive him back. Secondly, Paul instructs the church of Galatia. Galatia, it's the 
place we go to for dealing with people on a discipline level. If a person be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore that person. It doesn't mean that they have the same responsibilities and roles they once had, but listen, you're not supposed to just cast them aside if they truly are trying to get right with God. Help them along, counsel if they need to, get them to a place where they can be right with God again and right with those in the church. Does not James instruct us of the same thing? He tells us as Christians that we're not only supposed to confess our sins, we're supposed to confess our sins one to another. Ew, that's a humbling thing. I'm not going to confess one. Not, not saying that your private sins you confess, but if you sinned against a brother or sister in Christ, you're to go to them, humble yourself, say, look, I blew it. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? But that's not even practiced today by Christians. We have failed to follow the scriptural mandates. So I give you that information as a reference that we don't believe this portion of scripture is talking about a backslidden Christian. A Christian that even wanders in sin. And you may say, that person can't be saved for doing that. Look, I've been right there. There's no way that person can be saved. But I'm not their judge. God's their judge. And I hope they get right with God and they come back. So I want you to look at the word here in our text. The word knowledge in verse number 26. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. This is a key word here. The word knowledge, I've done different studies in this in different portions of Scripture. It's a Greek word, epigenosis, and what it has the idea of a full knowledge or a recognition of truth, a recognition of truth. Now, you need to understand this because this is kind of where we're going in this text. You can be a person who is faithful to a church, recognize the truth. I have asked people, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Oh, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior? Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Have you ever made a personal profession of faith that you've trusted? Yes, I made that personal profession of faith that I've trusted Jesus Christ my Savior. And yet their life shows nothing. They have no desire to read the Bible. They have no desire to be a part of a church. They have no desire to pray. They have no desire. To... But they say, I believe all that. Now, hear me. That's recognizing the truth. That's having knowledge of it. But they've never put their personal faith and trust in it. They've even prayed prayers. And so we understand that this idea of the knowledge is talking about even in a case of full knowledge. They've heard it. They may have even been a Sunday school teacher. They may have been a, been a pastor. Say, how in the world could that be? Someone who is a pastor, meaning they went to college, they've been to seminary, and they've heard all the explanations of the gospel, and they're teaching it. Somehow it didn't go from here to here, and they were just treating it as a job. They were just treating it as what they did. Maybe they grew up in church all their life, and it was just something that they did. Man, all my friends are at church. All my family's at church. It's everybody I know. Where, you know, I like church. They're good people. And they could grow up through the church and never have a full Faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone. They have knowledge, they have recognition of the truth, but they've never personally trusted in Jesus Christ where it's taken effect. The word truth here in verse number 26 as well is the matter, it relates back to the matter being discussed. What is the matter being discussed? In this text here, it's the sufficiency of Jesus Christ to pay for all your sins. Jesus Christ paying for your sins. Look at verse number 19. This is part of that greater context, chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest, that's Jesus Christ, over the house of God. Here is just the, the broader context he's talking about. Uh, those that should have knowledge of this truth that Jesus Christ truly is God, that he is their great high priest, that he's done everything necessary to provide for them salvation, deliverance from their sin debt. And so the word for here in verse number 26 draws us back to this greater context. This should be a motiv motivating factor to all of us as believers to keep drawing close to God. Keep drawing close to God. Not that you fear losing your salvation, but that you're going to just stick close to God, that you're not going to go back on your faith. 
The Old Testament, those who were defiantly living in sin that disobeyed the Mosaic law were actually put to death. Now, we don't live in a theocracy. That's not something we would practice today. But in the Old Testament, God set up the nation of Israel specifically, and that was one of his rules. If they willfully, defiantly went against certain laws, there was no more forgiveness for them. They were put to death. How would you like to live in those times? Most of us wouldn't have survived. I would not have survived as a young man. Just be real with yourself. So let me just give you the points here that I want to make mention of. Verses 26 through 29, I want to talk to you about the rejection of the truth. According to verse number 26, the rejection of truth, first of all, it is willful. It's those who have at some point in time in life, they've been in church, they might have grown up in church, they might have made a profession of faith, they might have even been baptized, gone through all the rituals that a church has to offer, but it never truly sunk in. They never truly were changed from the inside. And they were willfully, willingly to walk away from the truth. Those who sin willfully by rejecting Jesus' payment for sin, notice what our text tells us in verse number 29. I'm going to skip ahead here, verse 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath, notice here, first of all, trodden underfoot the Son of God. Those who have heard the truth, recognized the truth, made some form of profession, perhaps grew up in church, were faithful for a while, but then just said, you know what? This stuff's not for me. I'm out of here. And have no desire to go back to God. They've rejected the gospel. They've rejected the message of God's grace. And what the scriptures say here, they have trampled underfoot the Son of God. That would be like laying laying Jesus Christ down here and stepping on him, saying, you're worthless. What you did, what you say you did is worthless to me. Those who have knowledge of the truth but willfully walk away, our text says that's what they're doing. Secondly, in verse number 29, it also says that not only do they trample underfoot the Son of God, but they have counted the blood of the covenant as what? As an unholy thing. They've, they've treated what Christ did for us as common and unholy. That's what the, the idea there means. So Jesus Christ, who is God before the foundation of the world, chose to come and be a part of his own creation in order to lay his life down for us. He's saying all that Jesus Christ did as God for you, they've just cast it aside saying, oh, that's worthless. That, that means nothing to me. Thirdly, we notice in verse number 29, it says here, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now that despite unto is kind of a a strange way of saying it. The word there means insults. And he hath insulted the Spirit of grace. Who's the Spirit of grace? Talk about the Holy Spirit of God. Grace means God's favor towards us. Those who willfully reject the truth that Jesus Christ truly is God, that his blood was sufficient, that his, his uh, uh, sacrifice on the cross was sufficient, his death, his burial resurrection was sufficient to pay our sin debt. Those who treat uh, uh, that as something can be cast aside, they insult the spirit of God. God's grace, that gracious gift he wants to bestow on people, they just treat it like it's something worthless. So this is what our context is talking about. It's the rejection of the truth. Those who have knowledge of it, they've actually maybe acquiesced for a time in their life. They've, they've maybe they've grown up and they've heard it all their life and say, yeah, I give assent to that. Sure, that, that sounds plausible. They've never fully trusted and, and, and followed Jesus Christ, though, as their personal Savior. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 3 as a cross-reference here. Or not 3, 13. Matthew 13. Let me just point out a couple of things here. We, uh, we compare Scripture with Scripture, and I just want you to understand what is something that might add a little more light to this. Because we're looking at who would do such a thing to the precious gift of Jesus Christ by willfully walking away from the truth if they've been exposed to that truth. Who would walk away? Who would treat Christ so despicably? 
Matthew chapter 13, verse number 19, we see this parable of the, the soil, as we call it. Some people call it different things. But verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then, he cometh, then cometh the wicked one, that's talking about Satan, and catcheth the way that which was sown in, in the heart. Now, we just talked about in our connection group tables that the heart there has a reference to that inner person, your thoughts, your emotions, your mind, your will, your intellect, that inner person of you. That's what part of you is changed by God when he comes into you. It says, this is he which received seed by the wayside. In other words, it never really took root. They heard the message, but it didn't mean anything to them. Now, notice the next group. Verse 20, but he that received the seed in the stony places is the same as he that heareth the word and anon, which means immediately with joy he received it. Oh, there's been many people that I've had the privilege of giving the gospel and seeing the excitement and the enthusiasm in their face, even tears on their faces. Man, this is awesome. You mean I'm forgiven? You mean God forgives me of all? I have, I have no longer to be guilty before my God. I, I now can know for sure I'm going to heaven. Yes. And they get so excited. And they stay faithful and they live for God and they love God. doesn't mean they don't go through trials, but they live for God. Then others have had the same experience and then whatever happened to so-and-so? Where, where, where's so-and-so? And there's no fruit in their life at all. Nothing. They would even say that they even, they even prayed a prayer and asked God to save them. Verse 21, yet hath not Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution rises because of the word, by and by he is offended. And they walk away from the truth. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Listen to you, those who made profession of faith. You understood there was flaws in the Judaistic system. Now you understand Jesus Christ alone for salvation. What do you have to go back to? Why would you go back to that? Don't leave the truth for something that you know is not complete. And then verse number 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh, what's the word? Unfruitful. Unfruitful. Of the four soils, the, the, the fourth one there is the good ground, and that's the one that actually bears fruit in their life. And we recognize that as we study this portion of Scripture, we see kind of the, the parallel or the comparison here that there are those who heard the truth, they recognized the truth, perhaps part of their life they lived in the truth, but then they came to a point where they willfully rejected that truth to the point where they said, I deny Jesus Christ. We call that apostasy. We studied it in chapter 6. It's falling away. Those who fall away from the faith or apostatize, as it is called. How can someone who is sanctified fall away? This is what our text says in verse number 29. And here's one of the rejections to this. In verse 29 it says, Hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. An unholy thing. You say, wait a minute. Doesn't sanctification mean salvation? No. Sanctification means set apart. Let me give you a, another illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible tells us that an unsaved wife or an unsaved husband because of the saved partner is sanctified. Does that mean saved? No. That reference there has a reference to their children not being in their mind as religious people illegitimate. That does nothing to deal with illegitimacy. If you're truly married, your child's not illegitimate. It doesn't matter if one's saved or not. And he was giving the reference that they are sanctified by the, the believing spouse, meaning they're set apart. Doesn't mean that they're saved, doesn't mean they're even religious. Here the reference is the fact that someone who has grown up in religious ranks has been kind of identified as those who are set apart for God. Does this make sense? So because they come to church, because they participate in spiritual things, because they have knowledge of the scriptures, knowledge, they would be considered those who are part of that set-apart group. But what is, there, what is revealed about them is that's not true in their heart. It's only true on the outside. 
To understand this, that's, that, that's something that you need to really get a, get a hold of. So the term sanctified has the idea of being one who was or is set apart, but for a while they too were set apart outwardly, but inwardly they had no lasting belief. I want you to notice next, not only was it a willful departure from the truth, but it was also, it is a condemned in the Old Testament. And this is why I want you to look at verse number 28. This is how we get the understanding of the context. Verse 28 is a quote from the Old Testament. I won't take you there, but it would be Deuteronomy chapter 17. It says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's, a, that's almost a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 17. Say, why is that important? Because it gives us context to what the writer was writing about. So we can rule out the fact that it was a loss of salvation because somebody backslid or committed so many sins. We're looking now at someone who is willfully willing to go against the law. Here's what the law says. If you violate this law, here's the consequence. There are people in the Old Testament, as Israelites, people who are set apart for God. Listen, saved or unsaved, the Israelites were all set apart for God. But even though they were set apart for God, not all of them were believers. They were just part of that group, just like in the churches today. We don't know who's truly saved here today or not saved. But you'd be considered a churchgoer. And people would say, oh, yeah, they're sanctified. They go to that church. They set apart themselves to go to church. In that reference, it's kind of a very generic way of explaining it, they're set apart. But we don't know who truly believes. Now, we can see fruit in people's lives sometimes, but God's the ultimate judge of that. So I just want to make reference of this. The Old Testament condemned this type of behavior. If you know the truth and you violate certain of the Old Testament laws and you did it purposefully, there was actually no sacrifice provided for a presumptuous sin. So if you willfully said, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyways... There was no sacrifice for that kind of sin. And they died if there was two or three witnesses who witnessed them do that type of sin. And it was certain sins. So what what does that have to do with our text? It puts it into perspective that this was someone who, as a believer, was not someone who was just backslidden, but it's someone who now, in our text, because of what it says here, verse 29 through 31, those who willfully treated the, 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 the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his offering of grace to us, they despised it and cast it aside after they were well informed of what it was. And they treated it as something that was worthless. Let me give you, in verse number 30 and 31, let me just read this to you. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And so this is a reference now going back to the Old Testament where God says, I will judge my people. Here's the laws that I'm going to set up. This is, if they violate these particular laws, here's how you judge these people. And the same God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, and that judgment will come someday. Verse number 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's just driving home this point for those who have been exposed to the truth of the gospel. They've had made some type of recognition of it in their heart and mind. And they willfully walk away. They they say, I reject Jesus Christ as God and that he is the Savior. Those people have a fearful looking forward to meeting their maker someday. Not their Savior, their maker. I want you to read just a couple modern illustrations. Those today that you would know their names as I read them, their own testimonies of once being involved with Christianity and walking away. I'll just read you some. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to malign them. My prayer for them would be, repent, come back. God wants you. But this is a modern equivalent to what's being stated here in the Scriptures. Some of you may know this name, Katy Perry. She has been open about her disdain for the Christian faith, saying in a 2013 interview with Marie Claire, I don't believe in a heaven or a hell or in an old man sitting on a throne. I believe in a higher power bigger than me because that keeps me accountable. 
Now, if you read the rest of the article, and uh, I, I could not print out all the information here, she grew up, as many of you may know of her testimony, grew up in a uh, pastor's home. Her father was a Pentecostal pastor. Growing up in the home, though, she grew to, she sang in church. That's where she started learning how to sing and everything. But she grew to a point where more her, her, of her statements are even harsher than that about Jesus Christ. And she denies having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I don't want anything to do with him. That's just one. 2007 Emmy Award Ceremony, Kathy Griffin made headlines with her acceptable acceptance speech where she said, a lot of people come up here and thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this reward than Jesus. And she's probably very true on that statement, actually. But then she makes an inappropriate reference, and I'll read it in quotes here. Suck it, Jesus. This is an accepting speech. They did not put that part on TV, but they put the full quote in the magazine. This award is my God, is what she goes on to say. Say, well, all right, Katy Perry grew up in a Christian home. Kathy Griffin grew up in a Christian home. I can go on. Brad Pitt grew up as a strict Baptist as a young man. Today he says that he is neither. He is an atheist or an agnostic, best he can explain by himself. Julia Roberts, Roberts grew up as a Baptist and a Catholic. Mom, mom or dad, one, one was uh, a Baptist, one was a Catholic. She is now a Hindu. And she, they, these people have made statements of rejecting the Christian faith. Mark Twain, going back some years, it's one of the most notorious. If you read Mark Twain's writings, some of you had to read it in literature in school, some of his writings are the most incense, how do you say it, incendiary against faith in Jesus Christ, grew up as a Presbyterian young man, Christian household, very faithful household, rejected it, and denies Jesus Christ. Charles Darwin, to some of you that would be no surprise, but you didn't know the young Charles Darwin, very faithful to church, very faithful man, but the more educated he became, the more disdain he had for Christianity and Christian truth. See, folks, you have to understand, these are people that had once had exposure to the truth. They grew up understanding the truth. They went through the rituals and practices of their Christian religions until they came to a place where they say, I reject Jesus Christ. I reject that he is the only way to heaven. I reject the blood. I reject the covenant. I reject his grace. That's what this portion of Scripture seems to be a reference to. It's not those who backslide. It's not those who um, are struggling in their sin. It's those who have heard the truth, maybe even participated in a while, and got to the point where they said, not for me. I don't want it. I reject it. Let me just give you, in conclusion, it brings certain judgment. Verse 27 again, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. That's going to come someday. So when will that judgment come for them? Well, when they die. And then at the end of everything, the Bible talks about a great white throne judgment where all the world will be judged, unsaved world will be judged for their sins. No chance of escaping in their judgment, no chance of getting into heaven. They will all be judged and cast into their eternity without God. Verse 29 says, speaks of a sore punishment. You know what that's in reference to? The people in the Old Testament that were put to death, I was talking about them who disobeyed Moses' law, they were put to death. He says, how much sore punishment would it be for those today that have heard the gospel, understood it, rejected it, they'll have an eternal punishment affixed to them. Well, let me now talk to you about the settling of your fears. <laughs> Hopefully this had nothing to apply to you. But let me just quickly scan down here. We'll be done here in just a, a minute. Scan down. Verse number 35. Let me just read you the positives of this. Verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal confident, as your personal Savior, you can have great confidence that you are His. And there's nothing for you to go back to. What's there to go back to in your old form of religion? What's there to go back to in a, non, uh, a no faith? What is there to go back to that does not have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? 
Don't cast away that confidence in Jesus Christ. Verse number 36, notice what he's saying. Again, the writer is writing to people who have been converted to Christian faith and who are going through persecution. He says in verse number 36, For ye have need of patience. What is that patience? Endurance. Endure the trials of life. Don't quit on God. Be faithful to the end, is what he's saying. Verse number 37. For yet a little while, and he shall come, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. There's going to come a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back for his own. And what he's saying is be faithful. He's coming back for you. This is positive. Settle your fears. He's coming back for you someday. Don't let the trials and tribulation of this world pull you away. Verse number 38, he says to live by faith, but the just shall live by faith. And then he also says in verse number 38, don't draw back on God. And then I want you to notice what he says in verse number 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That word perdition there means destruction. But of them that believe to the saving of the what? Soul. Listen, folks, let me settle your fears. If you truly believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died in your, on, in your place on that cross, that he rose again from the dead, he proved that he was God, he makes this offer to you, a gracious offer. Believe on me, have your sin debt forgiven, and a relationship so that someday I will bring you to heaven. What a beautiful thing that God has done to settle our fears that you don't have to be a part of those who will be judged for your sin someday. Father, thank you for the word of God.